So uh, we're moving on to the, the final speaker for this afternoon. Uh, pleased to welcome uh, Matthew Bell, who's the Chief Executive for the Committee on Climate Change. And he's going to be talking to us about the Road to Paris 2015, which is the uh, COP21 meeting. So over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, and thank you all. It's been, I'm relatively new into the job, so I'm about five months or so into, uh, into this position. And certainly one of the things that I wanted to bring to the job, but also one of the things that's been very clear over the last number of months as I've been learning a lot as opposed to saying a lot, um, is that the credibility of the committee, and I'll come on to talk about exactly what it does in more detail, but the credibility of the committee depends an awful lot on the fact that we are able to properly interpret the scientific evidence and the science base behind climate change and reflect that uh, to both the public and to MPs, members of the House of Lords and the government. Um, in the other direction, I think the committee also probably has a role in trying to signal where we think the gaps are in the evidence base as we are trying to use it in the, in the formulation of policy and the formulation of, uh, of legal regulatory duties, where we think the gaps are and what we think would be valuable in terms of longer term thinking and wider areas of research. And so I'll try to, I'll try to certainly point that out uh, now, but I'm keen to have a longer, a longer term dialogue and very glad to be here today for that purpose as well. I thought I would, uh, in talking about Road to Paris, um, talk about it in three segments also, in a sense. First is just talk about the UK and the, the policy framework and the institutional framework we have in the UK for tackling climate change. Second, focus on what I think some of the issues will be in Paris and particularly one particular aspect that hopefully is, is, is relevant today and useful in some of your research. And finally, just where the UK is leading up into Paris and what might come out of it. So first of all, so first of all the UK, it's worth, it's worth starting with the science because in terms of the work that the committee does, the, the science is the foundation then for everything that follows. And the reason that we're acting on climate change and the reason that the committee exists is because of the scientific evidence around, around climate change. And the debate around that scientific evidence, and I guess one of the things that surprised me a little bit coming into the job, is that most of the debate, perhaps some of the debate uh, in the papers is about whether climate change is happening, but actually most of the debate is not about whether climate change is happening. Most of the debate is about the uncertainty around which that change is happening. And so the uncertainty around the temperature predictions or the uncertainty around the sea level rises or the uncertainty around the various metrics we have for measuring the changes that are happening to the world and the uncertainty of those impacts. And so how do we understand what the impacts are? And we had the last question about humans. How do we understand what the impacts are in practice of those changes on humans, on natural environment, on animals and so forth? So that's the area where lots of the debate really is, and properly understanding that uncertainty, properly understanding how we can, uh, how we act in the face of what sensible actions are to take in face of that uncertainty. The way in which, as many of you will know, the way in which uh, the UK has set up a sort of institutional framework then around that scientific and around, around that science evidence base is that in 2008, uh, Parliament passed the Climate Change Act. I was very taken by the, uh, uh, one of the slides in one of the earlier presentations that showed the, the huge storm and the, the evidence base being the, the calm at the center of the storm. And if I can steal that analogy, the way in which the Climate Change Act tries to uh, set up an institutional framework is it tries to set up something that can act as the calm in the center of the storm while allowing all the debates to rage on and hopefully take that uh, sort of draw that into the debate w when needed. One of the notable things about, about the Climate Change Act is that it was passed in 2008 with huge cross-party support. So a third, a third reading out of the 650-odd MPs across all parties in the House of Commons, only three MPs voted against the Climate Change Act itself. So it had massive cross-party support at the time, and I'll come on to sort of where it sits now. And it had that support largely because it 
it tries to do two relatively simple things, but things that hadn't been done before. And so what it does is it says, first of all, on the mitigation side, so on action to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to set ourselves a relatively long-term target, 2050 target that says, by 2050, as the UK, we want to have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% relative to 1990 levels. And it sets up a process for how we're going to get there. And that process is, is these carbon budgets, five yearly chunks of time between 2008 and 2050, where we're going to say, in each five-year period, how much emissions reduction do we have to undertake in order for us to be on track in a cost-effective way, in a way that takes into account the risks and the costs and the benefits, in a cost-effective way towards that 2050 target. It sets that up on the mitigation side, and it sets up an independent body, the body that I lead, the Committee on Climate Change, an independent body to advise parliament and government on that whole process, so to advise on the carbon budgets, what they should be for each five yearly period, and to advise on progress on an annual basis towards both the 2050 target and within each of the carbon budgets. And I'll look at some of that uh, data in a second. The second thing that the Climate Change Act does is it sets up a similar structure on adaptation. And so climate, the Committee on Climate Change also has a statutory duty to report to Parliament about whether the actions being taken in the UK to adapt to the climate change that's already happening are commensurate with the risks that we think are being imposed. And so it provides an assessment of what is formerly a DEFRA responsibility, the National Adaptation Programme, an assessment of the National Adaptation Programme for MPs and for parliamentarians so that they can consider from an independent point of view whether we're doing what is required to adapt to climate change and whether further action is needed. And so the, the Act creates a body that acts as that independent advice to Parliament on both, uh, on both, the, on both the mitigation and on the adaptation side. And in practice, there's a combination of scientists, economists, technology experts, others who, uh, who form part of the, of the committee and the wider secretariat. I mentioned uh, at, the, at the outset the, the sort of wide cross-party support that existed in 2008. And there's a temptation, I think, to think that that has, uh, has weathered away over the course of the last six or seven years. And so I think it is particularly notable, worth pointing out, that uh, going into the current election about 10 days ago or so, uh, the David Cameron, Nick Clegg, and Ed Miliband all signed a joint cross-party pledge which effectively upholds the Climate Change Act. They make three pledges that you can see up there that all three parties are committed to maintaining through the course of the, uh, of the next parliament. And it's, not it's notable for many reasons, but largely because in, in a previous life I was involved in lots of attempts to remove what you would have thought would be obvious things out of the political debate and out of the political discourse. And there's a very important and, uh, uh, and central role for Parliament MPs to play in lots of these debates. But you would have thought in lots of areas, whether it's healthcare or education or defense, in lots of areas you would have thought, yes, there's a reason to have a certain level of commitment going into an election, and then we can debate around the specific response to that commitment. And, and, and it's impossible to get those agreements. You never get those agreements because there's too much at stake going into an election campaign. And the fact that the three parties were willing to sign an agreement uh, related to climate change today and in the current circumstances by itself is very notable. And it removes some of the, uh, some of the sort of central planks that sit in the climate change out of that, out of that political debate to a large extent. In particular, the, the desire to stick to, or to a two-degree target consistent with international agreements that the UK has entered into and clearly that form the foundation leading into Paris uh, and the COP21 discussions at the end of the year. It reiterates the commitment to stick to the 2050 target and the domestic legislation around carbon budgets that I was outlining. And in, and in addition, it includes this idea 
of a commitment to accelerate the transition to a competitive, energy efficient, low carbon economy. Now, I'm sure through the course of both the election and the parliament, there'll be huge amounts of debate about precisely what that means and precisely what that is in policy terms, and all of you and us will have our say on it. But I guess the one thing that's clear is accelerate doesn't mean stand still or go backwards. And so you can have a debate around, around some of the, the definitions, but it's, uh, it's good to see everybody signing up to that, to that side of things. And from the committee's point of view, as an independent advisor, it's important that we are able, and to be the sort of calm in the center of the storm, it's important that we are able to stand above the politics and this kind of cross-party support for the foundations in a sense of the, of the infrastructure is important for us to be able to then stand above uh, lots of the politics and provide the advice in, a, in an impartial way. So that, that's the sort of institutional framework and setup that exists in the UK for thinking about climate change. And then how does some of that lead into Paris and, and, uh, and what's some of their, that resolution? As some of you will know much better than me, there are an awful lot of issues that will be discussed one way or another, both in Paris and leading up to Paris. There are pledges around the levels of emissions reduction that each, each country will make. And I was just talking to somebody about we were expecting all those pledges, initial sets of pledges anyway, to be out by the end of March. We'll see whether, whether that happens, what countries are committed to coming up with pledges between, uh, between now and the end of March. Um, there'll be a lot of discussion about how do we hold people to account for whatever pledges emerge from the Paris negotiations, lots of discussion about financial support and, and flows of financing as well as, well as wider types of non-financial support. And, I know that the, the British government and lots of discussions right now around what offers can be made around adaptation services and climate services, knowledge, expertise that can be provided to, uh, to countries to help them as well adapt and as part of a package of measures that, uh, that might come out of, uh, out of Paris. Uh, and discussion around international and sectors that are not so well captured in domestic arrangements like aviation and, and shipping. All, all of those many other issues will be discussed in Paris. One, the one I wanted to focus on for the purpose of, uh, of this talk uh, is one that hopefully is, is useful as well for, for all of you, which is this issue around the co-benefits and the links, and indeed it came up in some of the questioning, the links between tackling climate change and tackling a whole range of other outcomes, whether they're outcomes around health or outcomes around poverty or outcomes around a range of other issues that, uh, uh, that are linked to it. And that, that's important for the committee. The committee um, has a range of statutory duties. And so in line with, in, do, in making our advice, in providing our advice to parliament and to the government on the carbon budgets, on, uh, on the 2050 target and how we get to 2050, we have to take a whole range of things into account. And so the Climate Change Act sets out this range of things that we have to take into consideration in deciding what the right level of carbon budgets and what the right targets are. And they include impact on the competitiveness, for example, of UK industry and of, of the UK and of the British economy. They include the impact on the fiscal circumstances of the government, so the ability of Treasury to raise tax revenue, the ability of government to meet its requirements. They include the impact on energy security, um, on fuel poverty. So, they, so we have to take into account this whole range of additional impacts and of additional issues that uh, positively or negatively are affected by the recommendations that we make around, uh, around climate change. This, I, I allow myself as a quota, one slide per presentation that nobody's gonna be able to read. So this is my one slide per presentation that you can't read. But it's, it's interesting as a, as a kind of snapshot. It comes from the, uh, from the IPCC, the latest IP, IPCC report on the science around, uh, around climate change that came out last year. Um, and, uh, and so this is what happens when scientists do PowerPoint. Um, the, uh, the, what it does is it tries to look at adaptation and mitigation and the extent to which you can rely on adaptation to get you through 
uh, costs that climate change array, uh, creates, whether it's flooding or temperature rises, heating, water scarcity, desertification impacts on natural environment, how much can you not mitigate and just rely on the ability of humans, animals, plants, and other parts of the ecosystem to adapt to those changes versus how much should you do uh, prospectively in terms of trying to mitigate some of those, uh, some of those impacts? And it's the first, in terms of co-benefits, it's maybe the most obvious one, but it's also one of the areas that probably merits a, a lot more research and a lot more uh, discussion and debate, which is that trade-off between how much risk are we willing to accept to uh, different types of ecosystems, different parts of the planet, how much risk are we willing to accept? How much adaptation oh, can we do and what's the cost of that adaptation? And what do we want to do prospectively in terms of mitigation? I mean, the central message that this figure gets used to, to demonstrate is that you can't do everything by adaptation. You can't do nothing and think that you're going to adapt to all the changes that will happen if we keep, keep emitting greenhouse gases at the rate that we're going to emit them. But the interesting bit is the end of those bars and where that hashed part of the bar, which is sort of if you're willing to accept lots of risk, you're at one end of it and you adapt a lot. If you're willing to accept less risk, you're at the other end of it and you, you do more mitigation and then you have to do less adaptation when some of these effects feed through. So where you want to be there and how we better understand, because I think even the people who put this together would admit it's very much a first pass uh, at this issue, uh, how we better understand and better model the, the links between mitigation and adaptation is, uh, is a very important area of, of in that sort of co-benefit space. Um, but broadening out the, the sort of co-benefits, clearly actions to tackle emissions and therefore uh, to tackle climate change have much wider impacts and potentially beneficial impacts on air quality, on lifestyles, on health, on noise, on congestion and travel time, on a whole range of issues, some of which have, have come up today and have come up in, in questioning. Uh, and clearly some very big countries who have made very important countries that have made important statements about what they're willing to do to tackle climate change, and China's clearly at the top of that list, uh, you know, may very well be doing so partly for climate change reasons, but clearly partly for air quality reasons in the case of China, because the air quality issues are so great. And there's a, there's a synergy between tackling climate change and tackling air quality. At the same time, and we've seen it in the news recently, there are also... Uh, there are also debates where these things come into conflict. And so the issue that's been in the news recently around petrol cars versus diesel cars, and diesel cars clearly have lower greenhouse gas uh, content of emissions, but have poorer air quality uh, impacts and lots of debate around air quality in London and elsewhere. And are there trade-offs or are there not trade-offs and how do, you, uh, how do you take that into account? And so being clear about the scientific evidence base around the links between tackling climate change and some of these other wider benefits is very useful and is one of the very real areas of debate and discussion right now. And similarly, on the flip side, also being clear about what the wider costs are, uh, being able to quantify those, understand them, and make sure that they're properly taken into account in the policy debates that happen. Uh, the wider costs of tackling climate change the one that probably gets the most exposure is clearly impact on landscape and amenity value around some of the, uh, the renewables, uh, uh, the use of renewables to reduce emissions from the power sector. Hazardous waste to the extent that we're using nuclear partly to, uh, to, offset, uh, to offset emissions reductions. Road accidents, again, talked about air quality, the fact that some actions to tackle climate change also have negative impacts on air quality. The ability to provide a proper rounded evidence base and picture so that then the proper debates can happen in parliament and in policy circles around these issues is very important. And so linking climate change through to all these things, I think we'll see that in the course leading up to Paris, but we see that also uh, most definitely in the debate that's happening right now. There have been some attempts to, uh, uh, to try to look at, in a sense, that holistic picture to say, what do we think are the total costs of tackling climate change and what are the commensurate benefits that come from tackling it? Um, clearly, you know, 
from, from one point of view, the primary reason for tackling it is we believe that carbon has these, uh, carbon emissions have these impacts on temperature, on sea level rise, all these things which have certain impacts. But if we're looking at um, some of the, the wider co-benefits that you see them up there on congestion, on biodiversity, on water abstraction, air quality, you mentioned road accidents, lifestyle in terms of physical health. Can we, can we quantify and monetize for purposes of a discussion the, the benefits of in some of these other areas in order to set them against the resource costs, what we call the resource costs of tackling climate change. So again, there are various estimates of how much is it costing society to tackle climate change. And indeed, there are, there are estimates that range from it benefits us to tackle climate change in and of its own right to it costs us to, uh, to uh, tackle climate change. You can see even on so this particular paper, uh, a very wide error bar on those resource cost estimates. Um, a figure we tend to use, we tend to say it might cost, you know, it'll cost less than 1% of GDP, the types of initiatives that we're asking government to do, whether it be bring forward renewable technologies or bring forward electric vehicles, invest in some of these things such that you can bring them down cost curves, such that you can get the innovation to take place so that the technologies are in place when we actually need them in the 20s and 30s in order to meet our 2050 target. We, we put a cost of sort of at most 1% of GDP on those types of resource costs, um, which means in practice, if you think of sort of incomes doubling more you know, every 25, 30 years, it means that instead of incomes doubling by 2050, uh, sorry, by 2049, they might have doubled by 2050, so delaying by a year the period at which, uh, a point which people's incomes will double over, over, you know, assuming reasonable economic growth. If we look at those types of resource costs and we offset some of them against these other types of benefits, co-benefits, then you can see sort of the types of magnitudes that come out of this paper. And I was, uh, I was warned by one of the authors, it's by no means the be-all and end-all of the analysis. And one of the things that we need to do is to do this is to develop more sophisticated models and a better evidence base around, uh, around this analysis. But you can see some of the things that jump out, which might not be the things you expect. You know? The importance of savings on congestion costs, this is traffic congestion, you know, time wasted, people sitting in traffic jams, hugely beneficial as a co-benefit to tackling climate change. Now, is that because we've overvalued people's travel times and undervalued you know, the cost of water abstraction? I don't know, and that's where um, more research and better evidence base is needed. But you also see the massive bar around diet change and the impact on people's uh, physical well-being, health, uh, and how important that potentially is in the context and as a co-benefit. And understanding these things in much more detail and understanding the evidence base, being able to reduce the size of those error bars, and indeed, in some cases, the direction of the sign on some of these things is a very important part, will be one of the things that comes out of Paris, and is certainly one of the things from the committee's point of view um, that we're interested in seeing going ahead. So that on sort of co-benefits and certainly one of the issues that will be involved in Paris. In terms of the UK, where the UK is leading into Paris, so I was talking earlier about the framework we have here around our, our 2050 target and the series of carbon budgets leading up to 2050. So on this chart, you see, the, uh, you see where we were in 2000 on emissions levels. So the blue line is, is actual emissions levels greenhouse gas emissions. You see where we need to be by the time we get to 2050 to hit our 80% reduction target, which is quite a long way from where we are. Um, and you see the carbon budgets that have been legislated so far. So these are the five yearly budgets that say in each five year chunk of time, those are the greenhouse, that's the level of greenhouse gas reduction that we need to achieve and where we, where we are against that, uh, against that index. The carbon budgets get legislated quite far ahead of time because clearly you're making lots of both private sector and government is making lots of long-term investment decisions when you're deciding to invest in power plants or in infrastructure. These are 20, 30, 50, something even 100-year decisions. And so you want to know what the commitment is going to be in, on those types of timescales. So the carbon budgets are set 12 years ahead of time so that we know where we're going to be and we can develop that. And you can see that we met the first carbon budget, which is good news. Uh, we met the first carbon budget with a little bit of room to spare. The committee was very clear in, uh, in advising Parliament that 
a large, a large part of meeting that carbon budget was due to the financial crisis and the reduction in GDP and emissions that, uh, that was a consequence of that, as opposed to any active policy on the part of, on the part of government. And so that emphasizes uh, clearly the fact that there's a lot that has to be done in order to meet both budgets two and three, but most particularly, you'll see there's a very big step down when it comes to the mid-2020s, where the fourth carbon budget uh, sits a very big step down there, which again reflects the fact that we have more time to prepare for that, but also that the, the very early action, which is all, a lot of it being around decarbonizing the power sector and electricity supply, is explicitly intended to then allow you to decarbonize some other parts of the economy relatively quickly because you've then decarbonized electricity and, uh, and leading into uh, and using that then to, to feed into the to reduced emissions reductions in the rest of the in the rest of the economy. That so despite in a sense the uh, the good news on the on the first carbon budget. There's still a lot that has to be done in order to meet the second, third, fourth, and onwards to the, to the 2050 targets. Um, one of the big, I say immediate, it is over the next decade, um, but in that sense, one of the big immediate challenges is the ongoing decarbonization of the power sector. Um, and lots of the sort of the boards out there, carbon capture and storage, the role of nuclear, the role of wind power, all of these are, are clearly front of lots of the debate, what is the role of government, how much subsidy is required now in order to bring forward the innovation, uh, bring forward the, the, bring down the costs over time in order to get the power sector into a point where renewable technologies are able to compete absent any subsidy uh, with conventional technologies in a world where we have proper pricing of, of carbon emissions. The big uh, one of the biggest challenges following on from the power sector, and certainly one of the areas I would highlight the most in terms of future research and thinking, is around heat. And so what's the, what's the equivalent road that we're going to take on heat to the one that we're taking on, on power generation in order to reduce carbon emissions from heat? Um, clearly, for the UK, the vast, vast majority of houses are uh, heated through gas. Um, uh, and what we do in order to decarbonize gas for heating is, uh, is a big issue into the 2030s and 2040s. Uh, energy efficiency, uh, again, a big issue around not so much in that sense. This is one of the areas going back to sort of win-win situations, presentation from, uh, from SAB Miller earlier about how sort of both companies and the climate benefit from certain actions. There's, there's almost no debate that both households and the climate benefit from improved energy efficiency, but then there's a big distance between that realization and actually getting people to take up energy efficiency measures. And so lots of the behavioral research, lots of how, understanding how people behave and what the barriers are to actually taking up things that, uh, that might financially be in people's best interests, uh, important for take, how we increase the take up on energy efficiency. And again, going into the 2030s, clearly vehicle emissions, which actually have been one of the very good news stories going on um, over the past number of years because sort of EU directives and, and UK action means that vehicle emissions have been coming down, in fact, faster than the committee thought they would be when, uh, when the budgets were set. And, uh, and one of the reasons that, uh, that is not the financial crisis for why we, we've been performing so well is that vehicle emissions have been steadily improving thanks to um, EU regulation and the manufacturers meeting EU regulation targets around reduced uh, vehicle emissions. But that clearly becomes more and more challenging as we try to get that down to almost, almost zero levels of emissions from transport. Uh, and then finally, it's worth mentioning two areas which are, uh, in some senses, the least tackled so far and will become more and more important and will be a big part of the debate for the 2030s and 2040s and where ongoing research now could really valuably contribute alongside heat. Um, which are industry and agriculture. Agriculture and land use in general, one of those areas where the evidence base and the data is just so poor that it's hard to make almost any proposition and do any set of analysis around the costs and benefits of action. We're not even sure how much greenhouse gas, methane mainly in agriculture, emissions are coming from land use or indeed how much uh, forests are storing and uh, some of the presentations earlier about that, but wider debate around precisely what uh, the carbon content, both in emissions and in storage potential is of, of land use, land use change in agriculture. 
and properly understanding that in order for us to be able to properly then say what the policy response is to it is going to be increasingly important because as we tackle energy supply and as we tackle transport, the, uh, the importance of agriculture as a proportion of emissions only goes up and up and, uh, and being able to understand what action to take. And in some ways, the same goes for industry. Lots of, lots of industrial production, cement, steel, pharmaceuticals, um, how you reduce the emissions from those types of industries in a cost-effective way and in a way that still allows us to produce those needed products uh, is going to be very important and requires a lot of research and uh, a new innovation going forward. So going into Paris, the two things that on, a domestic, on the domestic side the, the Committee on Climate Change is doing, first of all, in, uh, in June of this year, so with the new parliament fresh from uh, new elections, assuming we have a sort of coherent government in place at that point in time, the, uh, the committee will deliver its progress report, which is a sort of state of the nation to parliament about where we stand against our climate change commitments. And for the first time ever, just because the, the sort of legal timetable happens to coincide, for the first time ever, that is a joint uh, state of the nation report both on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side. So we will be setting out for the new parliament where we are against where we should be, uh, both in terms of reductions in greenhouse gas emissions overall in terms of the carbon budgets in the 2050 target and in each of the sectors that I've been talking about. So in power and in heat and in agriculture and in transport and in industry. So a very bottom up and granular analysis as well as where we are against what we need to be doing to adapt to the changes that we're already seeing happening. And so are we putting in place the right measures in terms of tackling floods, water scarcity, impact on biodiversity, natural environment, and all of those. And so we are, as you would imagine, going through a, a big evidence collection phase. Um, we fund our own research uh, into lots of these areas ourselves, but also we collect lots of research that you do, that lots of others do uh, in academia, both in the UK and internationally, in order to inform uh, the decisions and the recommendations that the committee makes uh, to Parliament. Uh, and sometime, probably in the next 10 days or so, we'll put out a, a formal call for evidence as well that will uh, open the door to any further evidence uh, in terms of that process. So we'll deliver that progress report to Parliament in June. And then at the end of this year, in December, at precisely the same time as the negotiations are going on in Paris around COP21, we deliver our advice on what's called the fifth carbon budget, which is the next step in that chain. So the fifth carbon budget goes from 2028 to 2032. Uh, and I was mentioning the carbon budgets always get set 12 years in advance. The way it works is that we make a recommendation to government about what the carbon budget should be, and then government goes through the legislative process to enact that into law. So far, they've always accepted the recommendations and enacted those into law. I'm sure there'll be a, a debate over the fifth one and whether that gets accepted and how it gets enacted into law. Once it's legislated, then it's a legal requirement on the government of the day. And so 2028 is 12 years ahead of 2016. So we will provide our advice in December of this year. And then government has six months through 2016 uh, to, put that into, to put that into law. And then the fifth carbon budget then forms the next, uh, the next target, the next level to achieve in that step framework and the next bit against which we will report to Parliament about whether we are doing what is necessary to achieve, uh, to achieve that. So by way of, by way of conclusion, um, I mean, I've tried to point out a little bit along the way areas that I think new research and new thinking would be, would be very valuable over sort of a, a medium term time horizon. There are a few other very much ideas, um, uh, and, and you will have others and maybe better ones, uh, very much ideas up there. To, to pick out a few, um, and at the risk of asking the impossible, one of the things that probably you're very much aware of that we often in debate on is the near-term impacts of climate change and getting uh, more accurate, better understanding, better near-term modeling of climate change at a sort of decadal as opposed to 100-year, 200-year, millennial level um, would be very useful, I say, for my, uh, for my position here. 
And so work on near-term climate models and properly understanding the near-term changes that are going to happen and the, the near-term impact is really important in the policy world. I mean, as, as somebody was, was saying earlier, it's it, it, one of the very positive things about the Climate Change Act and the institutional setup through the carbon budget, through the committee, through the institutional setup that it creates is that it takes what can be a very short-term policy cycle. And actually, I think politicians do think quite long-term uh, in their defense. But it takes what can be quite a short-term policy cycle and forces a longer-term framework on that by setting up the carbon budgets and the longer-term tar market and the institutional setup. But even within that, um, because of the short-termism, us being able to have more accurate sense of the real science around near-term climate change, near-term impacts, is very valuable. Um, another area to pick up is the link between how we understand the impacts of climate change on the natural environment, the uncertainties around that, and how best we value it. So valuing those impacts on the natural environment, whether it's in monetary terms or in other terms, but how best we value those, the natural environment, the links between what's happening to the climate and the impacts on the natural environment, hugely important in the, in the political debate. And linked to that, sort of how to model these, this risk and uncertainty. So the uncertainty, partly inherent in the science, inherent in understanding what's going to happen to the climate and how the climate links to the natural environment and to, and to humans. Uh, modeling the, that uncertainty, modeling the risks, therefore, what risks are we willing to take and to act what whether you know, and to then act depending on how they whether they get realized or not versus what risk should we be acting against now and that goes a bit back to that uh, to that IPCC diagram around adaptation versus mitigation and what action should we be taking now what can we postpone until later how do you how do you model that in a rigorous way taking account of sort of all the development that's happened over the last number of years and decision theory risk analysis how do you properly take that into account in order to reach sensible decisions. And the final, the final part I'll, I'll highlight on that list is around behavior. Um, and picking up on one of the last questions, I think, on the previous session, but also on the, on the talk by Elizabeth earlier and on other speeches that we've heard, how do we understand human behavior better in order to understand what it is that uh, people are likely to take up? How are people likely to act? From our point of view at the committee, even just understanding what, we, what lifestyle changes and what behavioral changes we think would happen absent any kind of change in government policy, sort of a baseline between now and 2050, so that we had a better understanding of what we think the baseline level of emissions are likely to be between now and 2050, absent any action, um, taking a proper, proper account of behavioral issues and lifestyle changes, and then being able to understand better when government proposes policies, when we put regulation into place, when companies act in a certain way and competition evolves and markets develop, how do people behave in those environments with the constraints that they are under uh, in order to then be able to understand what's the best, most cost-effective, most sensible policies to put in place, taking account of that, the behavioral side, as well as sort of as an economist, what I would call the supply side, so as well as the technology and the driving the cost down and the innovation and all the supply side things that we rightly encourage and we rightly um, are focused on making sure we take similar, we have similar rigor and a similar understanding of the behavioral and the demand side of the equation so that then we can understand the likely impact of policies going forward. And with that, I will stop. So I'm, I'm conscious we're, we're running a bit short of time, but I think we, we can't leave it there without uh, opening the floor for, uh, for some questions. So. Who, who uh, I saw Ted was probably first, right over, over there on, on the left. Sorry, we've got the mic here. Yeah. Ted Shepard, Department of Meteorology, University of Reading. Um, I think the climate change uh, issue has been uh, cast, as you said, in terms of uh, mitigation and adaptation and, and, and the trade off. But that's, of course, such a challenging thing because you've got intergenerational aspects, uh, inter, you know, uh, um, rich, poor country, and so on. But if I got you, if I understood you right, the co-benefit, that's completely, that's not avoided climate change. That's just a co-
co-benefit independent of climate. Is that right? And you, you didn't even include things like a security costs to do with dependence on foil and oil and you know uh, st stuff like that. So it it seems to me that um, there's a lot of uh, difficulties in in uh, arguing that that a mitigation is is better than a adaptation, although that could be true. But it seems like that is such a simpler, more direct argument because uh, the benefits are more local. They're within the same generation. I mean, it's something that people can think about, right? People do think on five-year timescales. They don't think on 50-year timescales. So why isn't there more focus on that? Yeah, I'll uh, take one at a time. So why isn't there more focus on that? Um, some of it is... Some of it is because it's, it is surprisingly, I say surprisingly, it's not surprising, it is just very difficult to think in a really cross-cutting way. And I think that's true, I think that's true of government, I think that's, you know, I, I came from the private sector, I think that's true in companies, I think that's true more broadly, is that um, everybody as individuals and as uh, government departments and as parts of corporations, you, all, you have your specific silo and your particular objectives and the particular things that you're aiming at. And that might be reducing emissions or it might be improving the health of the nation or it might be reducing you know, respiratory disease or whatever. Um, and it's surprisingly difficult to get that cross-cutting uh, analysis done, N not just because it's difficult to get a cross-cutting analysis done, but then the benefits the way the benefits accrue is that they probably don't accrue to you only. They accrue to many people. They accrue to many bits of government. If, if society as a whole is larger, the benefit doesn't just come in the reduction in the required budget to the Department of Health. It also comes to a number of departments and similarly on the private sector side. So because the benefits accrue to lots of actors as well, it's very difficult to get, it's a big coordination problem, very difficult to coordinate all of that. So I think there, there are lots of um, very real reasons why we don't discuss it more. Um, and, uh, and I guess, in, in a part, my, my plea was that we should try to discuss it more. Um, and on the policy side, in the context of, for example, post-election, what will be a fairly comprehensive spending review that the government will go through, making sure that Treasury, uh, Department of, you know, Number 10, and policymakers properly think about those cross-cutting issues when deciding what to do with the large but limited pool of public funds, making sure that our private companies are doing that, making sure that we as households are doing that. How do we think about some of those cross-cutting benefits I think is very important, it's, but it's difficult. Yeah. Okay, we got a, another question uh, down, down here. Uh, we got a mic. Oh, here we are. No. Yes. Uh, Martin Rukitsky from uh, ex Oxfam and uh, UN agencies and stuff. Um, um, just a question with regard to uh, the matrix to measure the effectiveness of adaptation efforts. Uh, you said like uh, you, there will be a report on how well the UK does on, on adaptation, basically, but also globally. I think uh, I'd uh, be interested in how you assess. The um, like, how solid are the current measurement matrix, um, in your opinion, vis-a-vis -vis the quality and the effectiveness of adaptation? Specifically on adaptation. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean mitigation mm. has one indicator. Yes. Um, yeah. No, that the, uh, the the ch so the challenge on adaptation is that you don't have as simple a metric, um, probably doing a disservice to the, mitigate, to the mitigation side, but you, do, you don't have as simple a metric as, as reductions in greenhouse gases. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that the adaptation subcommittee, which is the bit of the, the Committee on Climate Change that, that advises on, uh, on adaptation, one of the things that they've spent the most time doing and that we've spent the most time doing is trying to come up with a framework and a set of indicators against which you can properly measure your progress in terms of resilience that you were talking about uh, and adaptation. And so as the UK, we've invested quite a lot 
in trying to think about what, what's a comparable set of metrics that you can apply on, uh, on the adaptation side that will allow you to understand are we, making, are we making the right decisions and what's the risk and what's the resilience and are we investing the right amount in a different level. And so I'd encourage you to look at, uh, look at some of the, the indicators that the, that the adaptation subcommittee has developed um, and they will be, they'll be in the progress report as well, but they're in the reports that are, that are on the website. Um, globally then, which, so our remit is, is only national, but, but globally then the challenge is, can we pick those up and use them elsewhere where it's sensible? There's clearly lots of work also being done, Netherlands, Germany, elsewhere, on, on metrics and ways of thinking about adaptation. And can we come up with a similar global sense of how do we measure our performance against certain risk factors on the adaptation side in order to understand whether progress, uh, whether the right investments and the right decisions are being made in adaptation. But as you say, it's more, it is more complicated on adaptation in some sense. Well, I, don't, I don't think that. So Paris clearly is, is primarily focused on, uh, on the mitigation side. Um, I think and coming up with an agreement about what we're going to do to cut greenhouse gas emissions globally. There is a very big and important part of that discussion, which is, uh, which is in some senses, what is the offer and what is the support that's going to be given uh, to lower income countries to adapt to some of the climate changes that are happening and whether as part of a package under which everybody signs up to certain mitigation measures, part of that package will be support, whether it's expertise, knowledge, funding, whatever, to a wide range of countries to help them adapt to the changes that are happening. That, at that level, I think that will be part of the discussion at Paris. Um, and I know that the British government is very keen to be able to offer something at that level. Um, but I don't think it will go as far as then coming up with the, the metrics and the measurement and the accounting framework, if you like, that goes around that. But that would be an obvious, an obvious next step. And certainly um, there'll be a number of those things coming out of Paris, um, which is why sort of, I think it would be a mistake to portray Paris in any way as the end of something. It's part of an ongoing process and there'll be another one and another one. Um, and some of the things that come out of Paris will be, can we put in place more credible international mechanisms for measuring some of these things, for trading emissions reductions? So better and more widely accepted accounting frameworks and measurement frameworks such that there's greater transparency at an international level about what's happening. Um, and that, I don't think that will be solved at Paris, but if there's agreement to move forward on those, then that would be a positive step for Paris. Okay. I think, given, given the time, and we said we finished at 4.30, we should uh, wrap up there and, and thank uh, Matthew. And then I'll give some more thanks to the other. So let's thank all the speakers for... Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed the day. Certainly, it's a very exciting time for responding to environmental change. And I hope you've uh, been motivated by some of our speakers from industry... Uh, the, the policy side of things and, and academia. And I hope also you got a chance to speak with some of our PhD students in the doctoral training partnerships. Uh, this, I'm sure we'll repeat uh, this kind of event again. The NERC are certainly very keen to fund us to do so. <laughs> and, and of course, it's in, in their mission to you know, think about the impact of uh, research and translation in, into industry and policy. So I'm sure we'll be seeing uh, more of you. Also, please keep in contact. Uh, we'd like to keep this discussion with, uh, with the people in the room and, and involvement in various activities at the, our universities. Uh, before we finish, I'd just like to thank some of the people who really helped organise the meeting. Uh, Simon Bailey, in particular, from Imperial, and Christiane and, and Luce from the team there, and Grantham and, and the DTP, and then Maria Niger in uh, the Walker Institute, and Philippa and Jill. Uh, at Reading. Thank you very much to them. And, and then I'd also like to thank uh, all our students who put on an excellent presentation today and also helped with the mics. And four of them are also rapporteurs. So the uh, summaries of the discussions today will be going as on, on blog sites associated with the, both DTPs. We'll just put the same thing on both sites, I think. And we'll send you some information about that as well as a request for some feedback through a very short uh, 
kind of doodle poll type survey, uh, and in particular, you can vote for your favourite poster when, when we send that to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming.